Okay, good morning. I'd like to check the attendance. Papyong, Yi Dongjun, Kim Minsu, Jo Ki Hoon, Kim Duk Jung, Kang Dok Gu. Yujun, Shubham, Alkan, Kim Jong-in, Che Won-seok, Kim Sang-hun, Song Yun-jae, Fan, Duong, Namang, Hirun Rabi, Kim Gi-han, Kwon Seo. Okay. In previous class, we have learned about the basic properties of the iron, and as I mentioned, without the magnetic ordering, the most stable state in low temperature of pure iron will be uh, phase entered the cubic crystal. But due to the contribution of the magnetic ordering, the most stable crystal structure will changes to the body center the cubic. And most important concept in iron and each alloy is solid solution. And what is solid solution? The, the meaning of the solid solution is the homogeneous mixture of two or more atoms in solid state. You may be familiar with the solution in liquid. For example, when you mix salt and water, it will form a liquid solution. The same concept can be applied when you understand the solid solution. It's a kind of random mixing of two or more kind of atom. Luckily, there are two kinds of solid solution depending on the position of the solute atom. One is interstitial solid solution in iron. For example, when you mix the iron atom, with hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. The position of this kind of atom will be interstitial site, which means that the site between the lattice atom. For example, lattice atom means the atom consist of the lattice structures. For example, when you consider the face center of the cubic, the, lattice at the position of the lattice atom will be each corner and each face. So, but when you mix up the ion atom with carbon or other very uh, small size atom, then this atom will occupy the site between the lattice atom. The site between lattice atom is called interstitial site, and there are several kinds of interstitial site in iron. We'll be discuss will later. When you mix up the iron atom with mangan, silicon, chromium, which is which has larger diameter, then this kind of solute atom cannot occupy the interstitial site because the size difference which is available for the interstitial site is too big and this kind of solute atom cannot be accommodated into interstitial site. So they have to occupy the lattice site. In this case we call this kind of solution as 
substitutional solid solution. As I mentioned, there are uh, two kind of, several kind of interstitial site. And in FCC ion and PCC ion, there is two kind of interstitial site. One is octahedral site, and the other is tetrahedral site. Octahedral means, octa means, eight, right? Hydra means phase. So the interstitial, interstitial site, which is surrounded by eight phase. So what will be the octahedral site in BCC ion? When you consider this site, this site will be covered by eight phase, which is consists of this six lattice atom. So we call this site in BCC as octahedral site. How many octahedral sites in one unicell? As you can see, the octahedral site in BCC are located in each phase and also each edge. Right? So how many sites is available in BCC ion? You have to consider that this site in one phase is shared by two unicell. And the site in H is shared by four unicell. Right? So how many site in H, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 12 site in H, but it is shared by 4 unicell and 6 atom at each phase, and this is shared by 2 unicell. So, No. <laughs> Six interstitial sites per one unicell of BCC atom. How about tetrahedral site? Tetrahedral site means four phase. The site surrounded by four phase. So when you consider this one, two, three, four atom, there are four phase, and at the center of this four phase, there are tetrahedral sites. And there are four tetrahedral sites in one phase. Right? And each tetrahedral site is shared by two unicell. So, four, six, There are 12 tetrahedral sites in BCC ion, right? One thing you have to remember that is when you see this octahedral site, the shape of this octahedron is not symmetric. When you consider the distance between these two atoms and these two atoms and these two atoms, this octahedral side is compressed along this direction, right? Are you clear? So that is one of the important property of the octahedral site in BCC ion. And this 
uh, unsymmetry shape of octahedroside cause some important phenomena, which is called Smoog effect, which we'll discuss in later uh, slide. Similar to the BCC ion, there are also octahedral site and tetrahedral site in FCC ion. So when you see this figure, the uh, octahedral site in FCC ion is located in corner and each uh, in center and each edges. Right? And as you can see, the shape of octahedral site, octahedron, is symmetry in this case. And how many octahedral sites in one FCC unit cell? The one in center and 12 in H, but this is shared by four unicell. So, is it correct? How about the hectatroidal site? Tetroidal site is consists of this one, two, three, four atom. And usually it is located one of four, one of four, one of four position in one unit cell. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight tetroidal site in FCC ion. And this tetroidal site is inside of the unicell is and not shared by other its neighbor unicell, right? So there are a tetrahedral site in FCC ion. So let's compare the size of this uh, interstitial site with. At first, let's consider how, how, much, how much is the size of this each interstitial site. This number is the number of sites per one ion atom. So when we, how, how many ion atom in BCC unit cell? Two. So when we consider the number of ion atom, this will be three and six, right? And how many ion atom in FCC? Four. So this is one and this is two, right? So when we convert the number of interstitial sites into the number per ion atom, will give this number, right? And when you use the hardware model, hardware model, you will obtain this radius for each interstitial site and drive this number is homework number one. So drive this number using hardware model and submit the homework next Tuesday, right? So when we use the radius of ion atom 
the radius of each interstitial site in iron rattis is given by this one. You can see the largest interstitial site is given by the octahedral site in FCC iron. It's around 0.5 Armstrong. When you compare this octahedral site, the, the size of this octahedral site with the size of octahedral site in BCC iron, you can easily understand. It, it, it provides much bigger interstitial site. That is one of the reasons why the solubility of carbon in FCC iron is much larger than the solubility of BCC iron. It is quite interesting because, as you know, the BCC is more open structure than FCC. FCC is more dense. Even with this situation, the carbon, much carbon, much more carbon is accommodated in FCC structure because the octahedral site in FCC structure provides much larger interstitial site. So when you can see when you see the atomic size of the boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or hydrogen, you can see all of the interstitial atom except hydrogen has larger diameter than the biggest interstitial site given by the iron vertices. Because when you see the biggest interstitial size is around 0.5, but most of this atom, the radius most of this atom is larger than the 0.5. So when you put this atom into iron batteries, it will distort the lattice. That is one of the reasons why you put the interstitial atom into the iron rattis, the strength is increased. When you distort the lattice, what happens? Yeah, so what cause? What is the origin of those kind of solid solution hardening? The meaning the material has higher strength is that you have to put much stress to move. To move what? This location. Right? So when the lattice is distorted, it is difficult for this location to move inside the lattice, right? So that is the origin of the solid solution hardening in a lattice structure. So when you put carbon, nitrogen into iron lattice, naturally you can expect the increase of the strength because of the distortion of the lattice. That is also one of the important reasons why the martensite has much higher strength than other structures, for example, ferrite, polite, or other high temperature product. When you heat up the specimen, low carbon steel, then put into the water, then you can obtain the martensite. The structure is called martensite. There are several reasons why martensite has higher strength. And one of the important reasons is that martensite is 
much more solid carbon, which is accommodate in equilibrium state. As you can see, when you see the BCC structures, the solution limit, solubility limit of carbon in BCC structure is 0.02. You cannot put the carbon into BCC structure over 0.028%. But when you heat up the specimen, then martensite, uh, the, the iron, the structure of, of iron will transform into austenite. And in austenite state, the austenite can accommodate maximum 2-8% of carbon. So when you quench, quench means that put the specimen into brass, uh, the put the specimen into the water, then the lattice structure it changes into the BCC. But there is no chance for the iron atom to be precipitated into the cementite or other carbide. So they are just freeze into BCC structure. So the BCC structure is saturated with carbon atom. And those solid carbon atom cause very, very big distortion in the BCC vertices. And that is why you can obtain very higher strengths in uh, martensitic structure. OK? Of course, there are many other reasons, several other reasons to cause the strength in uh, martensite, and we will handle this issue in later class. Uh, and one of the interesting thing is the hydrogen. When you see the diameter radius of the hydrogen, it is quite small compared to other interstitial atoms. It means that it can diffuse very quickly inside of the iron, even at room temperatures. So many people believe that the phenomena, which is called the delayed fracture. Delayed fracture means that when you form the specimen as a cup or other part, then there are some residual stress, right? And when the specimen containing hydrogen, the hydrogen will diffuse to the stressed part. And when there are some sufficiently uh, large amount of hydrogen is accumulated in some small area, then it can cause initiation site of cracks and cause very unexpected failure, which is called the delayed fracture. This is a slide that simply shows how the sparse, the carbon atom in iron lattice. This, let's assume this uh, black dot is lattice point of iron, and then this red dot is carbon atom when the weight percent of carbon, content of carbon is 0.04. When you consider the solubility limit of the BCC iron is 0.02, then the distribution of carbon atom inside of the uh, BCC vertices is much more sparse than this, which means that the, usually the carbon atom do not feel or understand, know existence of other carbon atom inside of the vertices.
even though the content of carbon in BCC iron is very, very small, sometimes we have to know, we want to know how much is solute carbon or nitrogen present in, inside of the BCC iron. In that case, we use the phenomena, the snow effect. Uh, the reason why we want to know the amount of the solute carbon or nitrogen inside of the uh, BCC iron is that uh, there are two kinds of the reason. One is to understand, to predict the strain, uh, strain, st strain aging. What, what is the strain aging? Any idea? Right. Exactly. When there are some interstitial atom and if you pull the specimen with the tensile machine, typical stress strain curve will be like this. And this phenomena is called yield point phenomena. And this elongation is called uh, yield elongation, which is caused by the local deformation of the propagation of the widow's band. And this phenomena is caused by the pinning of the initial dislocation by solute atom because there are a stress field around the dislocation and those kind of stress field can relax the distortion caused by the solute atom. So in some sense, the dislocation and solute atom like to each other. So at the first of the deformation, you have to break their relationship. So this uh, end point phenomena is caused by uh, those kind of breaking the relationship between the dislocation and solute atom. So when you stop the tensile test and unroll and then fool the specimen immediately, then it will follow the same stress strain curve. But when you unroll the specimen and hold it for several months or slightly heat up, then what will happen? The end point reappeared because the solute atom during the holding or during the heating, slightly heating of the specimen, the solute atom diffused into the core of the dislocation. This is very typical phenomena in terms of physical metallurgy, but unfortunately, the automobile industry do not like that kind of phenomena because this, when you get this uh, yield point elongation, when you, uh, when you do a foaming, there are some defect, which is called stretch strain. And because it 
it is regarded as a defect in the automobile industry, they really do not like that. So when the steel maker provide the cold or the sheet to the automobile company, they do skin pass rolling, which is the deform the sheet around this amount and sell the sheet. Then when the automobile company buy the sheet, they start to use, but there are some stocks. So if the automobile company put the stocks into the, for example, six or seven month, then this, at first, there are no yield point phenomena, but after six months, yield point reappeared. So automobile company want some guarantee how long we can keep the cold or the sheet. Usually, the steel industry, as our memory is correct, guarantee six months. So when the automobile company buy the sheet, then they have to use within six months to avoid a stretch strain. And how the steel maker guarantee they have to reduce the amount of solute atom in the ferrite matrix. They, and they have to know how much is there and how much they can reduce. So the Snook effect is to evaluate. Actually, we use this this pheno actually this is phenomena is used to evaluate the concentration of solute atom in the uh, BCC matrix. The principle is very simple. The Snook is the name of the engineer in Philips. He was born in Netherlands and he found that when he twist the wire and then unroll, then the wire wind rotated in other, the other direction and again twisted repeatedly and then eventually it stopped. What he found is when the amount of solute atom increase, the damping force against this twisting is increased, which means when the iron wire has higher solute concentration, it will stop, it will stop more early. So he called it is a snook effect. So what caused the increase of the damping force when you have much solute concentration inside the material? It is closely related with the skewed shape of octahedral side. When there are no stress, all of the octahedral site has the same possibility to accommodate carbon atom. There are no preference. But when you twist the specimen, which means when you apply the stress, some of the octahedral site will expand go along the compressed axis, which will give more large space to the carbon atom. 
So when you stress the specimen, there are now the carbon atom has preference to specific octahedral site. So they want to move to that site. And when the specimen is untwisted, the situation is reversed. And another octahedral site has preference. In that case, the carbon atom move to that site. So twist and untwist, during that process, the carbon atom inside of the crystal diffuse to this octahedral site and the other octahedral site. This kind of movement of carbon atom inside of crystal generate a damping force. That is similar when you rotate the egg. How can you differentiate the boiled and unboiled egg? Simply, when you rotate it, and then unboiled egg stop early because the liquid inside of the unboiled egg cause damping force to the rotation. That is very similar to the Snook effect, right? So what I found is that this is called the Snook fig. When we increase, any question? When we increase the concentration of the solute atom, the damping force is increased. But you have to remember, there are some critical temperature interval when you, where you observe the snook peak. Why there is some temperature interval? Why we can observe we cannot observe the snook peak at low temperature or very high temperature? Remember that Damping force is caused by diffusion of the carbon. And at low temperatures, the diffusion is too slow. And high temperatures, the diffusion is too fast to cause the damping force. That's, that is why we observed the snoop peak in specific temperature interval. There are some uh, facility which is called internal friction, which is the, the uh, exactly the same concept of the Snoop peak analysis and uh, the internal friction measurement also gives how much is damping force according to the temperatures and give you the uh, Snoop peak. And those kind of facility is available in JIT. And if you feel it is necessary for to evaluate the concentration of the solute atom in your sample, you can easily evaluate the concentration by using the equipment called internal friction. And finally, I would like to comment two different transformation mechanisms observed in iron and alloy. And we will handle these two kinds of 
transformation in whole one semester. And one is reconstructive transformation and the other is displacive transformation. And this, this kind of classification is given by the movement of lattice atom. You have to remember that this classification is rated with the movement of lattice atom, not interstitial one. In the reconstructive transformation, the lattice atom randomly across the interface between the mother phase and new phase. And this is interface, and when the interface is new, the atom in mother phase, which is water, this is mother, and this is new. When the interface is moved, the atom in mother phase randomly jump to the new phase. And there are no rules about the position. We do not know. Actually, we do not know about the position of one atom in mother phase and the one atom in the new phase. There is no relationship. It is randomly determined. But in case of displacive transformation, the transformed phase is formed by some kind of deformation on the mother phase. So the position of each atom in parent phase, the position of each lattice atom in parent uh, transformed phase is always predictable by some crystallographic theory. So in case of displaced transformation, when this interface is moved, then we already know how this atom is located, where this atom is located inside of the new phase. It is always already determined. So when we consider the transformation of the reconstru uh, transformation in reconstructive way, we do not worry about the stress relaxation. One thing is that usually the reconstructive transformation occurs in higher temperatures, so the transformation stress strain is relaxed easily, and also. there are no restriction at the interface. The generation of the transformation strain is a little bit small and negligible sometimes. But when you consider the displacive mechanism, usually there are no way to release the transformation strain accompanying the progress of the transformation. So that's why usually the shape of the transformed phase in displacive transformation has lenticular or very uh, narrow width, but uh, how can I say, the disk type to reduce the transformation strain. We will discuss in when we talk about the martensite transformation. So there are many transformation products in INN steel. So for example, 
when you heat up the low carbon steel, you can obtain the FCC structure, which is called austenite. And according to the cooling rate, you can obtain various type of transformation product. And the typical one is electromorphic ferrite, which is formed at the grain boundary of the austenite. And idiomorphic, which is formed inside of the austenite grain. And massive ferrite, when the carbon content is very, very small. And polite, which is the lamella structure plate, lamella plate structures of the alternating layer of ferrite and cementite. And with much and ferrite, bainite, and martensite. When we look at the transformation of the allotromorphic, idiomorphic, and massive, and polite, this kind of transformation belongs to the reconstructive transformation, which is governed by the diffusion of the reticent atom. Basically, the transformation is diffusion controlled. There is no doubt that martensite is formed by displacive manner. It is formed by deformation of austenite. That is the, uh, what I mean is that uh, it is not true that when we deform the material, but the lattice is deformed by the transformation, right? So there is no diffusion during the nucleation or growth process of the martensite. <coughs> it is governed by the shear and displacement in manner. There are some controversial controversy. There are some arguing whether the between state and ferrite or bainite is governed by the diffusion or governed by the shear mechanism. There are long history of those kind of arguing. But at this moment, I would like to say that between state and ferrite and bainite, in terms of lattice atom, in terms of lattice atom, the transformation is governed by displacing manner. But in these two cases, you have to remember that the terms displacive is only related with the reticent atom. Even in these two transformation, sometimes the diffusion of carbon occurs. For example, when you consider vidwan and ferrite, the carbon diffusion occurs always or in nucleation stage or growth stage. And when we consider the vanite transformation, the diffusion of carbon atom occurs when the nuclei of the vanite is formed. Okay, so uh, what I want to say is the terms of uh, reconstructive and displacive transformation is different, slightly different, when you say diffusion, tra diffusional transformation and diffusion risk transformation. So, I, have to, I hope for you to understand the difference between these two classifications. Okay? Any question? No? There are two reasons. Usually there are two reasons when the students do not raise any question. One is the class was perfect, and the other is terrible. <laughs>
Okay, see you in Thursday. Uh, Thursday. Thursday. 이동준. 네. 네.